he was going into an orgasmic ecstatic state of consciousness from not being touched. And that was like my first aha of, well, some people are turned on energetically, like they're turned on by having space and tease and anticipation and, and room to breathe and yearn and long. And because their energy field is bigger, they, you know, I've had people 30 feet away, they can have an orgasm without being touched. And it's because of the energetic field around the body and how sensitive that field is. And also how the nervous system developed in terms of sensitivity. Namaste, it's Sahara Rose, and welcome back to the Highest Self Podcast, a place where you discuss what makes you your soul's highest development. This episode is juicy, delicious, delightful, and all of the things. So I watched this new show called Sex, Love, Goop on Netflix, which is Gwyneth Paltrow's new show. If you've watched the first season of Goop Lab, this is actually the second season, and it's all about sex. And in it, she brought on this incredible expert named Miss Jaya, who dives into the different erotic blueprints. So I've heard about the erotic blueprints before. I actually did a quiz years back, and it's something that, you know me, I love archetypes, the Dharma archetypes, astrology, human design, Myers-Briggs, Enneagram, like throw me a system, I'm here for it. And I love this because it was all about your sexuality. And I'm sure you've noticed that certain partners are different. Maybe you have your own sexual flavor and your partner's is totally different. So for a lot of, especially women, we tend to be a little bit more sensual. We care about the room being clean and the lighting and the candles and the smell and the silky sheets and all these things really matter to us. Whereas Some people are a little bit more sexual. They just want to get to the point. They're turned on by porn and more sexual acts, whereas other people are more kink. It's like whips and chains, hands, cuffs, back little booty up with my belt, like (laughs) that and ludicrous energy right there that they're into a little bit of the pain and the the game of sexuality, the the dom-sub duality and all of that. And then we got the energetic types, which are more turned on by the thought of sex, that even just that lust and the romance and the sensations far before anything becomes physical. And that turns them on the most. And then we have people who shape shift and they actually shape shift according to their partner and their different moods. So in this episode, I sit down with Miss Jaya to talk about all of these different erotic blueprints. And she shares that in this episode, she actually dives much deeper into the erotic blueprints than normal because you know me, I got lots of questions, but I also really want to know how it connects with spirituality. And I really believe that our sexuality is a gateway to higher states of consciousness. So understanding why we are the way that we are, what turns us on, what are our desires, how do we experience pleasure opens us up to these gateways of higher levels of being and consciousness. So this episode is such a good one, not only for you to listen to, but to listen to with your partner. Maybe you send it over to them. You ask them afterwards, what is your erotic blueprint? It's also fun to kind of know your friends. I love talking to my different friends about theirs. And I learned so much about sexuality because each and every one of us is so different. And sometimes we think that the things that turn us on are the things that must turn everyone on, but that's actually not true. So this is such just a fun, rich, pleasure-filled conversation. I loved having it and I know you're going to adore listening to it. And of course, if you're interested in this type of conversation, come join my Divine Feminine Mystery School, Rose Gold Goddesses, where we dive deep into womb wisdom, joy, the divine feminine, the goddess, and all things sacred. Because I truly believe that when we tap into the pathway of beauty, we allow ourselves to experience the bliss that is all forms of life. So if you're interested in learning more, head over to rosegoldgoddesses.com. So are you a sensual, a kink, a sexual, an energetic, or a shapeshifter? You're about to find out in this episode. So without further ado, let's welcome Miss Jaya to the Highest Self Podcast. And before we get started, I'd love to share with you this special offer. Are you ready to finally discover your soul's purpose, the big reason why you are here? 
Well, I've created a free masterclass experience for you where you will discover what your dharma is and how it may be different from your career, how to navigate through having multiple passions, different ways to transition into your dharma, ways to overcome people pleasing and caring what other people think, my number one tool whether knowing a decision is right for you, and journal prompts on the different types of resistance and how they show up for us. All of this is available for you for free in my Discover Your Soul's Purpose Masterclass. You can head over to IamSaharRose.com slash masterclass to join today. Again, that's IamSaharRose.com slash masterclass. And you can find that link in the show notes. I'm super excited to see you in there. Welcome, Jaya, to the Highest Self Podcast. It's so great to have you here. It's such a pleasure to be here. Mm. And the first question I'd love to ask you is what makes you your highest self? Me. (laughs) You know, um, I am, I am this, I am everything. I am nothing. I am love. You are that. I am that. Mm. Yeah. So beautiful, simple, and just a remembrance for all of us of just like my highest self is right here in this physical body, in this flesh, in these desires, in all of it. And there's no separation. Nope. None. It's right here, right now, this. Mm. So I'd love to know for you, how did your sexuality become a pathway for your spirituality? That started very, very young. I, when I was young, I had interesting experiences early on of not separating spirituality from sexuality. So when I would pray, I grew up Catholic. And when I would pray, I would be in pleasure. I would be in ecstasy. I would, I would go into these different states of consciousness. So for me, it was like never the separation of pleasure and sexuality or ecstasy and bliss some of these, these positive emotions that we experience when we're in that pleasure and God, that was, and I don't know how I got that because Catholicism does not teach that, but somehow that was, that was what I came in very early with and exploring my body and, and having my body be prayerful. Mm, maybe in past lives, you were a tantrika for many, many lifetimes. I think so. <laughs> I think, I think I kind of came in with this. Like I joke that, uh, You know, some people are good at accounting. Some people are good at playing the drums. I was good at going into ecstatic states of consciousness through my body. I love that. Definitely relate to the tantrika piece. (laughs) Yes. And it, and for so many of us, that's a huge learning of, of never feeling that of being good in the mind or good in the doing, but not knowing how to receive and feel that pleasure. So how are the erotic archetypes? How do they birth through you? So the erotic blueprints came through for many years of working with people. So I've almost three decades, I've been working with sexuality. I started very young. I remember when I was in school, even saying like, I want to be Dr. Ruth when I grow up, I want to teach sexuality. And I just started exploring more and more of like, well, what turns us on? What's erotically possible? How are people different from one another? And I was really into like the Enneagram and astrology, like all the different typing systems. I know you're into Ayurveda. So like Ayurveda, I did Ayurvedic studies. And um, so there was just this interest in both human sexuality and in who we are, who are we fundamentally in our deepest core of our being. And then how does programming conditioning shape who we are? Mm -hmm. Like, who are we truly? And then what's the conditioning on top of all of that? And so working with, I have a special license as a somatic sexologist, which means I work with people's bodies. And over all of this time and all of this study, I just started noticing patterns. So I noticed, I'll never forget the day I was in my office. I had this couple I was working with and he couldn't get aroused. And she's like trying all this. She's like, I'm reading the Cosmo magazine. Like I'm, I'm trying all the techniques and she's showing me all the things she's trying. And, and I just started to hover my hands over his body really slowly far away, you know, maybe like a couple of feet off of his body. And he started to shake and started to quiver and started to breathe differently. Everything in his, like, he's getting that, like he's turned on kind of breath. And he gets an erection and she's looking at me with these huge wide eyes, his eyes pop open and he's like, what's happening. 
And he was going into an orgasmic ecstatic state of consciousness from not being touched. And that was like my first aha of, well, some people are turned on energetically. Like they're turned on by having space and tease and anticipation and, and room to breathe and yearn and long. And because their energy field is bigger, they, you know, I've had people 30 feet away. They can have an orgasm without being touched. And it's because of the energetic field around the body and how sensitive that field is. And also how the nervous system developed in terms of sensitivity. Mm. To touch. Yeah. So very fascinating. So you have an amazing quiz on your website that people can find out their erotic blueprint, which I highly suggest we'll link to that. So I'd love to dive into the different blueprints because it really is such a foundational tool for people. I, I basically have all my friends take it too. Like I know every, <laughs> all my friends like to have sex. It's just like, press me friends. I need to know what, what's going on in the bedroom. <laughs> So let's talk about energetic. We'll start there because I know a lot of, especially spiritual people, they may really resonate with the ability to energetically connect to their sexuality. So you gave this amazing analogy of the cakes. I remember hearing and how the way that you would consume a cake kind of tells you what your blueprint (laughs) is. Yeah. So an energetic, as I mentioned, loves longing, anticipation, space, tease. So for someone who's energetic, if you're feeding them a piece of cake and you wanted to turn them on, it would be like you, you maybe bring it up to their lips, but then you take it away Mm -hmm. or you let them have like a, a little lick of it. And then you take it away because their system is so sensitive that even just being near the cake, like you could feel the energy of the cake and what it might taste like. And your body's already starting to respond. Maybe even just hearing us talk right now, your mouth is starting to water thinking about having some cake. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that, that energetic, it's this, it's like still water and energetic. And then if you like go diving in the lake, you're going to create all these ripples in the, in the system. And so it's, it's like you dip your tip of your finger in and then you let it ripple out and you watch that expansion happen in the system. Mm. And that's, that's enough. And I think that's what a lot of people don't get with the energetic is like, that's such a little tiny thing can be so big. And when you give them that space to expand, they'll expand into a full, like their superpower is like huge orgasmic capacity and not just orgasmic capacity in the physical body, orgasmic capacity in the energy systems, like having energetic orgasms in all of your chakras or having that shoot up your spine. People talk about Kundalini orgasms or going into other dimensionality of sex. So there's multi-dimensional orgasmic states that you can go into. And this has been kind of like, these are kind of my fun geeky things that I geek out on is like what's possible with our systems and with the energetic system and outside of our bodies even. And I'll, I'll tell a quick story because it's very energetic, a blueprint because I'm highly energetic. So that's my number one right now. But I was laying on the floor with a lover and we were just laying there. We had our eyes closed and he just held up like his pinky finger. And I, I like, I kind of put my pinky finger next to his, but we weren't even touching pinky fingers. It was just pinky fingers. We both just eyes closed again on the floor, barely touching pinky fingers. And it was like, whoosh, I shot way out of my body. And he found me at way out. Like, you know, he wasn't trying to do anything else. He just was like, okay, where'd she go? And he went like way out into the energy fields with me. And I just started weeping because he found me so far, like outside my body. And I called it my first out of body orgasm. And it was like, I'd waited 5,000 lifetimes for this orgasm and I'm just weeping and I'm shaking and I'm in this pure orgasmic state. And so when I talk about these other dimensionalities of this, it's, there's all kinds of interesting transpersonal places that we can go. And I know your listeners like this kind of stuff. So, Mm. you know, going deeply into archetypes, seeing the divine feminine or the divine masculine in someone and making love in that realm of like Shiva and Shakti or, or playing with, with these ideas of what we can do just, just with these systems that we have. It's so, it's really incredible. It's really, really incredible. Mm. The shadow of the energetic, however, is that they um, short circuit because Mm. they're so sensitive. It's like in that moment, if, 
my lover who I'm just barely touching pinky fingers with and we're flying out of our bodies to find each other in this totally other realm. If he had like started kissing me or laid on top of me, I would have lost the whole, the whole thing. Right. So energetics being that they're so sensitive, if somebody goes too quick, too fast, too much stimulation, they can short circuit. And then it's like, where did the turn on go? Or they dissociate, not in the out of body, happy, ecstatic place, but just like not there. Mm. Oftentimes because there's some kind of trauma or something that's unresolved in their system that makes a hypersensitivity that has them dissociating from their body. Mm, So fascinating. I've had those realizations in an orgasm of like, this is who we are. Yes. We are the (laughs) orgasm. I mean, every single one of us is a living orgasm. Yes. (laughs) And especially do you find the cervix orgasms are like more connected to these energetic states? It depends really on the body system and how that body system has developed. So sometimes cervical orgasm, because it's a different part of the nervous system, it's more the parasympathetic, that deep relaxing, like it's deeper in the pelvis. It can take people into deeper states of consciousness. Um, I quite like the combination of both those deep states and the high notes so that I've got like that you know, kind of going in my, in my body, but I've also got boom, 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 boom. You know, if it were a piece of music, I've got, I've got both of that happening, which then can keep the expansion roiling in a different way. Mm, But everybody's different. I remember hearing once that the clitoris was the archetype of the maiden, the G spot, the wild woman and the cervix, the crone. Yes. um, I I completely relate to that very Mm. much. Yeah, because the the clitoris has that, it's different part of the nervous system again, that's more like the fight or flight, it's more adrenaline, it's more like activate, excite, 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 excite. And then you've got that G spot, which then when that's unleashed, it's like juice everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's like release and expression and can get very, very wild. And then and then the cervix, yes, being this deeper, richer, wise, it's a very different orgasm, deep pelvis. Mm. Do you find that often females tend to be more energetic than males? Because I, I know I commonly hear of like, my man goes too fast and too hard. And so I wonder if they're a little bit more wired for the sexual type. Yeah, we've... Uh... We've had over, I think it's like a million and a half people now who've taken the quiz. About half, we had about half that, and we took the results and we looked at gender and blueprint and what what were men mostly, what were women mostly, what were people who identified as other genders, um, you know, non-binary or trans women, trans men. Like we we looked at that whole map based on what people wrote for their gender. And it's always fascinating to me because I really want to break gender myths around, especially what we found for men was that not all men are sexual, which I think is really great because I think men kind of get stereotyped into this box of of that archetype. And there were a lot of energetics and a lot of shapeshifters. And so men were kind of across the board, all different kinds of blueprints. Mm. But what we found with people who identified as women was that it was mostly energetic and sensual Mm. blueprints. So a lot of energetic actually with the women. Now that could also be our audience a little bit. You know, I don't know how many sexuals are like, yeah, I'm going to go take a sex quiz. So Mm -hmm. just want to keep that in mind too, as we look at these results. But I found it fascinating because a lot of advice is all women are sensual and all men are sexual. Mm -hmm. And that isn't necessarily true. Men are everything and there's a high energetic with women. Mm, So fascinating. So if you are an energetic, how can you communicate with your partner of how to sexually interact with you in a way that doesn't cause you to short circuit? Yeah. Slow down, Mm -hmm. (laughs) even slower. (laughs) And and even one of the ways that I love to communicate or, or show energetics is to take your partner's hand, your lover's hand and show them how light and show them how slow or touch their body, you know, touch their shoulder. Mm-hmm. I love how you take deep breaths when, when I start to discover like, mm, I can feel yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. 
you know, just that super, super light, like barely fingertips and just instruct them. And sometimes you don't know, like you didn't know you're energetic. So it's also about discovery of, well, what is it that really turns me on? Let's try some different kinds of touch. Let's try you sitting across the room and just looking at me and, mm. you know, seducing me with how ravenous you are. I, I give this one for sexuals oftentimes when it's a sexual energetic together, because they pair together a lot mm. is have the sexual sit across the room, keeping the full sexual, like rat want to come over there and eat you, you know, kind of energy and not do it though. You know, like that can be the hottest thing for an energetic is, mm-hmm. Just communicating, hey, the space is where the turn on is. And it can be hard for the other blueprints to understand that, but really helping them get that that's the turn on. The turn on is in the space. Mm, I love that. Yes, that anticipation, that going slow, just the touch. And even if it never leads to penetration, just that gentle opening, especially when so many of us were on our computers all the day and we're so in our like masculine that it does take that unraveling. So for people who are listening, you know, we, we did an episode before with BB. I don't know if you know her, she teaches a something called energetic lovemaking. And so many are like, I want to have energetic orgasms. Like this is my goal for 2022. <laughs> Can we, if that is not our primary architect, train ourselves? I absolutely used to be sexual and then you shifted. Yeah. No, I was always sexual energetic, very like almost close, but I was high, mostly sexual before with Mm -hmm. energetic, like right underneath it. So, Mm -hmm. but I developed energetic pretty young, but it's something that can be cultivated, something that can be learned, something that can be developed. So no matter what blueprint you are, you can cultivate energetic orgasms. One is watch other, if you can watch other people having an energetic orgasm. There's lots of demonstrations on YouTube. There's stuff in our courses. If you go see Sex, Love and Goop, the Sex, Love and Goop show that we did, um, that there's the energetic in the second episode in there. I'm demonstrating that. So one thing is seeing that it's possible because our psyche our psyche, when it sees somebody else does do it, re- resonates. And so then once we've resonated with that, then it becomes possible for us. And this goes for anything in life. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, anything that we see, it's like, oh, wow, that's possible. I could do that. So the belief in just trusting in that I can do it. Mm -hmm. The second thing my partner always says, he says, because he was not energetic at all. He had like 5% energetic. Ian? Ian, yeah. Wow, because you guys on the show, I'm like, you guys are the most energetic (laughs) people I've ever seen. (laughs) Everything you see him do is cultivated. He learned to do all that. And now he can have energetic organs, but he thought it, he thought it was like, he was totally skeptical. He's like, what is this weird woman? When he first met me, you know, cause I'm like shaking around and I, I warn people, you know, I tell them I don't have epilepsy. I don't like, this is how I orgasm. <laughs> Often, this all this Disclaimer, shaking. this is how Disclaimer. I orgasm. You might have to find me in the serious star galaxy, but <laughs> I'm around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he was so willing. And I think that that's the biggest piece with relationship is, is your partner willing to learn the language? Cause these are like languages and he was willing to learn how to be with me in an energetic way. He was willing to take classes and learn from other people. The thing that really unlocked energetic orgasm for him was a uh, network spinal analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, John Amaral, who's also in the first season of Goop. And we've had him on um, the podcast here as well. Oh, you have? Oh, yeah. cool. So yeah, so um, he, John helped him just really super open up to all of it. And then after that, he could really feel energy. Mm. So if you don't feel energy right now, it can be a learned skill. So I recommend like go take Reiki classes or learn healing touch or do some chakra meditations Um, just start to get in touch with energy, learn energetic anatomy, learn how that corresponds to the glandular systems in the body. How does this system work and, and geek out first on the brain stuff and then start to go into embodying that and feeling that. And, um, yeah, just, it's a journey. It's a journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's important too. It's like, to not make it this like goal of like, I right. need to have the energetic. It's not this <laughs> achievement, you know, it's right. just an, a natural progression of energy. I actually think it's, it's part of our natural state of being. 
Mm-hmm. It's just that we've shut it down over time. And as we grow up and we learn, oh, you know, you can't just like flop around in ecstatic states or whatever, you know, whatever programming we get. But I do think that once we can, we open up all those channels, it is a natural flow. It's just a natural flow of life force. It's Shakti. It's, it's chi. it's prana. You know, there's all kinds of different words that many different people use for it. But when, once that life force is awakened in you, something happens that's quite special and extraordinary and Mm -hmm. making it a goal oftentimes prevents it. And you're not broken or wrong if you're not experiencing it. Mm. It's only if you want to, and you want to explore this, you can generate this. Oftentimes people are seeking it, trying to find it, but I really would love to reframe that to like, this is something that's natural to us and we can generate orgasmic state. We can generate feeling good because we have all the hormones and the chemical makeup in our body system to generate it. Mm. So for those out there who think, how can I have an orgasm without contracting my body? I can't even fathom how that would work. You know, and even in my own practice, I find when you breathe, it it does prevent that (laughs) climax from happening. And I'm like, shit, what am I doing this for? So what is your advice there to allow us to breathe and open up that container to greater states of pleasure? Yeah. Um, you know, some people are more like tension orgasmers. I'm, I'm one of them. I'm Mm -hmm. completely like, I love to tense my body and hold my breath and use that. Actually, you can use that as fuel. Um, so breath work is one way, the breath work of finding, well, is it when I hold my breath that arousal increases or when I exhale that arousal increases, is it long, slow breaths? Is it quick, quick, you know, open mouth, open eyed breathing. A lot of it is experimentation. I wouldn't say there's any like, this is the one technique for all people to do to expand into this. I can speak from my own experience that what I often will do is I'll inhale the breath up my spine. I'll hold the breath. I'll contract my pelvic floor. I'll draw my belly button and I'll kind of squeeze that whole tube of the spine up into the pineal gland and up into the pituitary and the brain and really focus there. And then when I exhale, let everything expand, Mm. but that's all during stimulation. So you could be having someone go down on you or having someone do, you know, touch on you or something where they're stimulating you during that so that I don't let necessarily lose arousal. Or you could be doing this on your own body, of course, like self-pleasure. You don't need a partner to explore your sexuality at all. It's another myth that I like to bust. You know, Mm -hmm. we can do this all on our own. We can play our own instrument and then Mm. invite others to play it too. So you think even with the holding of breath, you can still have energetic orgasms? Because I thought that you needed to be uh, uh, the whole time for it to be considered energetic. No, not necessarily. Um, I can do it that way too, where it's the uh, like a holotropic breath or yeah. something like that, where you're doing that or a Dallas erotic breath. Um, mm-hmm. You can use those. I often find my energetic orgasm happens in the stillness of stopping everything and holding my breath. Mm -hmm. And then once I exhale, kaboom, Mm. all of the neurochemicals hit me and I'll go right into this ecstatic orgasmic state and the energy will expand. It's sort of like if you've done Wim Hof breath and you have the breath holds and you release and it's, and you really do feel orgasmic in that experience. So I think amplifying that with the, with the physical sensation, just allows you to have that full body release and say yes to the twitching and the jerking or those spinal waves that want to happen. Like let all that flow. Don't try to, um, hold it. I will hold my body for a moment, but then after that, Mm -hmm. then let all that flow move Mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So good. All right. So let's talk central because that's my other archetype. (laughs) So the cake is essential. How do we eat it? Yeah. (laughs) So sensual is someone who's turned on by all of their senses being ignited. So taste, smell, beautiful spaces. Um, The environment can be important for a sensual, but often what's what I find the majority of sensuals really need are those toggles. You talked about being on your computer all day and kind of needing those things that help us move from the tension of life or mundane world into the erotic world, into the sensual world. So the superpower of the sensual is that they bring beauty to the erotic experience. They bring whole body to the experience as well. So orgasm 
doesn't just happen in the genitals. It can happen in the back of your knee or it can happen from kisses on your neck or something delicious that you put into your mouth and swirl around and, you know, just that flavor. I once had an experience where I had a piece of chocolate. It was like a raspberry chocolate. And I started weeping just from like, like, oh my gosh, the taste of this is just so... I don't even, I don't even have words for that moment. It's just so extraordinary. And so that's the beauty of their eroticism is in this yum, delicious. I just think like, even when I talk about it, I start to like wave my body. Oh, I'm tasting the chocolate strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a piece of great music and you roll around in bed together, you know, pressing body parts and all, it's like grinding and yummy and... I don't know if you ever had one of those makeout sessions early in your sexuality or like you just make out for hours, but your bodies are sort of rubbing together, like mm-hmm. the, that rubbing, yummy sensuality, it's very sensual. Mm. So the shadow side of the sensual is you get caught up in your head and that it is hard to make these transitions from dishes and work and kids and all the things into the erotic realm. And so some suggestions on that are just take a few minutes to create space, create sacred space. You know, that's a little bit energetic, but create beautiful space, create art, make your bedroom an artistic space. If you look around the place where you make love, is there television? Is there clutter? Is there like just this? I will often when I'm training men, I'll I'll say, okay, just take 10 minutes to clean up the bedroom and you, that will do wonders for your partner being able to stay present and in the moment with you so that they're not thinking about the thing that's on the floor, the socks or the laundry or just whatever in life. It's, you really have to create an environment where you're taken out of the mundane of life and into the romantic and the erotic and the story. Context is so important. Mm-hmm. What is the context in which you're making love? Is it your lovers who haven't seen each other in 10 years and you're reuniting? Like what's the romance? of it and can you can you purposefully and consciously create that context that turns you on mm, so beautifully said i know for myself the music is so important and it's almost like i'm making love i'm like dancing choreographed to the music and like my orgasms are like at the time that he's in his falsetto and it's like but then if there's a song i don't like it's like i need to change the song yeah. Yeah. and and then my my husband's like is it that he's like, I'm not even listening to the music. I'm like, Oh no, it is. This is like the main, I'm really making love to the music right now. So there is that it's like, you're feeling it all, but then that little thing or that thought that comes into your mind can just completely take you out of it. Yes, absolutely. My, there's a funny story with, this was after the blueprints. I could never understand why my partner Ian, why he would like run around doing th- like fixing things or making sure the music I'm like, come on, like I'm turn on, like, let's do it. This is my, my sexual talking. Right. Yeah. And, um, and one time he was like doing all this energy play on me and he's like, got his hands like right over my vulva. There's all this energetic connection. And I'm flopping around having energy orgasms. And all of a sudden he just like jumps up and goes like fix the music. And I'm, I just started laughing because I knew exactly what was happening. His sensual could not handle. So he couldn't stay present with me. He could stay mm-hmm. connected with me. And that little fix then has him come back to me. And then mm-hmm. instead of being mad at him, I could just be like, oh, he's actually taking care of me so that he he's taking care of himself so he can be present with me. Mm-hmm. And it gave us a new understanding because we had this different language. Mm. Yeah, that's so beautiful to have that permission and understanding because I think sometimes people are like, oh, that's like a buzz kill or you broke the vibe. And to know that he, because he is sensual, it does deeply impact him. And it, it also takes courage to change the music and to be like, I, I need the setting to be different. Otherwise it's just in your head and it's like blocking you from really being present. Yeah. Yeah. You can't feel what's happening in between your legs when your head is going a hundred miles. Yeah. And I, and I can imagine too, for mothers who have kids, it's also that like fear. What if someone knocks on the door or, you know, we're too loud and get a lock. Yes, (laughs) exactly. You can give, and for a sensual type, do you think that we should give ourselves a certain amount of time? You hear people say, give yourself at least one hour, two hours, yeah, create a container, but don't let that don't let that be a de- like reason why you don't have sex. Because mm-hmm. I also can see that like sometimes people are like, oh, but we need two hours, mm-hmm. and then they never are having sex because they have kids and they have they have twenty minutes. So mm-hmm. 
um, give yourself spaciousness and time and to luxuriate and the deliciousness for sure. Mm-hmm. But also give yourselves like, what can we do to make that transition so that if we only have a half an hour, then we're still connecting. Or mm-hmm. maybe in that half an hour, it's not about penetration. Maybe in that half an hour for sensuals, maybe it's about you giving mm-hmm. or it's about um, cuddling or something else. It's a makeout. Like we're going to do 20 minute makeout sessions. Mm-hmm. We're gonna lock the door. We're going to do a 20 minute makeout. And then we're going to come back and make dinner, you know? Mm. Do you think this is a sensual thing? Sometimes I think if the sex is like expected at a certain time, it turns me off. Yes. <laughs> is that a sensual <laughs> thing? You, sensuals can't have any pressure. Mm, so yes. It feels like there's pressure to be turned on or pressure like, oh my gosh, we're, we have, we're going to have penetration now. Then that can feel like, or pressure to have an orgasm. Like um, sometimes sensuals have partners who are like, like, rub, 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 rub. Are you coming? Are you coming? Are you coming? Yeah. It's like, they're waiting for you to come. And that's just going to keep you from having an orgasm because you're under pressure. And as soon as there's pressure, mind starts rolling and turn off. Mm -hmm. Totally. Like I remember it was my birthday. So it's like that expectation you're going to have birthday sex, but it like turned me off from the experience because it just felt like this is what we're supposed to do. And then we ended up having sex and it wasn't even that great because again, I mentally wasn't there. And then like the next day we just woke up and it spontaneously happened. And it was so much better because it just came from this organic space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have, I always have a yes and around it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like, if you aren't having sex because your schedules are so busy and all of that, it's okay to schedule sex. Like Mm -hmm. Ian and I, we scheduled sex for a very long time for many, many years, every Friday afternoon, after my podcast, we would do, (laughs) we would have sex, but it was, we called it intimacy time, not like let's have intercourse because I think we have a limited definition of sex. Sex isn't just a penis inside of a vagina. Sex is looking at each other from across the room. I can have an orgasm that way. Sex is cuddling for that time that you have. And so we would just organically let whatever wanted to unfold, unfold. Mm. And so, so there was planned spontaneity or, and sometimes we just have spontaneous sex, but mm-hmm. planned spontaneity really worked for us when our son was really little, because we just didn't have that space and time really to create these long, luxurious sessions. Totally. And sometimes if you're just wait, it's you expect it to organically happen the same way when you started dating, where there's just so much, so many hormones going on that then when it's not happening, you think something's wrong with the relationship, but it's just, you know, you're, you're focused on maybe different things right now. So you, I love, it's just intimacy time. And maybe that's just lying in bed next to each other. Maybe it turns into intercourse, maybe it doesn't, but to just give yourself that connection time that we're so deeply needing as a society. Yeah. Yeah. As a whole, like Mm -hmm. cuddle puddles. I'm all for it now. Now that we're starting to have some relief from all this, it's like, let's just get together and cuddle because we need touch. Mm -hmm. Humans need touch. Every cell in our our body is wired for Mm -hmm. pleasure Mm -hmm. and our skin is wired to be touched. And babies who don't get touched get inability to thrive. They have difficulty walking. They have difficulty talking. They don't develop. We need that touch. Mm, So powerful. Mm, I know this episode is good, but so is this sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. It is so important to have someone that you can openly talk to about your issues and what's going on. Sometimes we use our friends as therapists, but that's really not what they're for. Our therapist is our therapist. And I know in my life, it has been beyond helpful to have someone hold space for me so I can openly speak about what's going on in my mind and have someone to reflect back my thoughts at me so I can find more clarity and overcome any anxiety that I have been feeling. So I am so excited to be partnering with BetterHelp. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. You can even message your therapist throughout the week for additional support. 
It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So please don't wait weeks to find someone to talk to. There has never been a more important time to invest in your mental health because you, my friend, are your greatest asset. Again, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Highest Self Podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Sahara. Again, that's better help h-e-l-p dot com slash sahara for 10% off so let's talk about the sexual type how does this show up how do how do they eat their cakes <laughs> <laughs> oh yes we have to talk about sensuals eating cakes because it's a whole experience oh my gosh it's a whole experience there's like swirling the icing around on your lips and having the cake melt in your mouth and smelling the cake before you even eat it. And the sight of the cake, maybe it's a rich chocolate with a red raspberry frosting or something. I'm into chocolate raspberry today. Uh, You know, so there's like, there's so many layers to feeding the sensual, this piece of cake. Mm. A sexual likes to eat their cake. You put a bite on a fork and you put it in their mouth and they chew it and they swallow it. (laughs) That is the sexual eating their cake. The sexuals are what we think of as sex in our culture. Orgasms, nudity, penetration, get that end goal. We think of erections. We think of wetness. We think of sex as intercourse as the main event, orgasm, as the cherry, like the fireworks that happen in sex. The shadow side of the sexual is that they can get so focused on the end goal that they miss the whole journey. And they think that everybody else is wrong. (laughs) I hear this all the time when they're in their shadow is like, well, it was never a problem for any other, my other partners or uh, we're having orgasms. So what's wrong? Or I can get an erection and then I, you know, da, da, da. So what's wrong? Like, it's it's like, because there's orgasm, because there's erection, because there's wetness, nothing is wrong. But Mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily what makes great sex for all the other blueprints, right? Mm -hmm. So they forget that there's all this other, and also because we live in a culture of the sexual, like that's Mm -hmm. what sex is for our culture. Mm -hmm. And the superpower of the sexual, however, is that sex is doesn't lack depth. I don't want to say sexuals lack depth at all. They have a lot of depth, but it's very simple. It's like zero to 60. You put the pedal down and it goes and it crosses the finish line. And, you know, it's the cannonball in the water. And the cannonball is amazing to a sexual, you know, we're high diving right off, big splash. And that feels good and it feels satisfactory. It relaxes the sexual's entire system. Whereas a sensual needs to relax and have these toggles before they move into the sexual realm. The sexual is in the sexual realm. (laughs) Mm. And when they have that orgasm, it is like everything is right in the world. Their nervous system can calm down. Everything can relax. The gas pedal can release and they can just be. Mm. They can just be. Yeah, it's it sounds to me like the the male the penis orgasm how like after that ejaculation you're, they're just in that space of complete calmness whereas I feel like for women maybe after the first orgasm you're just getting started you know you're <laughs> like oh finally I'm turned on we can we can begin this <laughs> yeah um, you know it's interesting being in a vulva body and being a sexual because there are there are those people and I was one of them. And it was like, once I had that orgasm, it was like, I could breathe again. Mm. I could breathe again. And then I was like, okay, now I can focus on you. Now so I can- what do you want to keep going after? Or did it feel complete for you? For me, it felt complete. If I had a certain kind of orgasm, clitoral okay. focused, clitoral head orgasm. Mm-hmm. Now, if it was one of these deeper pelvic orgasms or an ejaculatory orgasm, then I want to keep going. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I think all these things are possible as, especially as we integrate masculine and feminine energies, especially as we integrate some of this in our own systems, it becomes very possible. Like an exploration that I've done is like touching the clitoris as if it is a penis touching, you know, like 
playing in a different way with the body parts just because it's an interesting exploration and I'm all about what is erotically possible. So what does this do if we play with it completely differently or we go into different kinds of energies and or, or we have an intention to integrate those energies? What does that look like within the play in our pelvic floor? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I can resonate with that feeling of sometimes you just want sex. Like you want an orgasm, you want to come. And it's like that, that lust and that craving for it. And it can just be like, Oh, like, how did I not give this to myself earlier? Like this feels so good. <laughs> you know? Like, why do I do anything else? But this, if I have access to this for free in my body at any time, like this is the cheat code. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's dopamine talking, you know, dopamine is like, you just want to keep hitting that lever, but luckily Mm -hmm. we also have prolactin, which balances that out and gives us a refractory period and has us go eat and do other things than have sex all the time. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) thank you prolactin. Uh, But that neurochem, that biochemistry is different in everybody's body. So Mm -hmm. some people are high dope. I'm a high dopamine person, high dopamine, high testosterone, you know, and that, how that chemistry even plays a role in our blueprinting. I think that that has a lot to do with how my sexual was so prominent Mm. in that, oh, I want that orgasm. I want to go for it. And then I'm ready to go to the the next thing. Are you a Pitta Dosha? I'm not. I'm actually a lot of Vata. Okay. Because when I travel, I get crazy high Pitta. Okay. So really the pitta sounds to me like that testosterone and like that sexual. <laughs> I'm curious. You should add the doshas to the quiz and see where yeah. everyone. I love overlapping all these things. Yeah. Like, how do the doshas play out? How do love languages play out? Mm-hmm. How does Enneagram play out? Like, it's so fun to just look at, look at, it's like a snapshot of yourself in this mm. moment. And then one of the things I loved about Enneagram when I was studying Enneagram was it shows you where you're limited. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about that more when we get to the shapeshifter, but mm, think- cool. And do you think that to move into more energetic orgasms, our practice could be to not allow ourselves to orgasm and to prolong Absolutely. It. Okay. to not have the, so here, here's an interesting just conversation around orgasm. Mm-hmm. So what kind of orgasm? Mm. You know, not allow yourself to have what kind of orgasm? Is it Mm -hmm. a clitoral? Like what I'll do is I'll not allow myself to have that clitoral orgasm that I feel done after. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, okay, I'll play with deeper pelvic orgasm or I'll play with um, deeper clitoral orgasm. I'll play with nipple orgasms or neck gasm. I'll play with like different kinds of orgasms. And then from that, I can keep expanding my vocabulary. It's like, Mm. it's like letters of the alphabet. If A is my clitoral orgasm, my go-to, I know I can have it like in a couple of probably 30 seconds and then I could go, okay, well then I'll go to vaginal orgasm. I know I can do those. Like I have my vocabulary of where I'm resourced and then I can start to wire in these other places, Mm. other kinds of orgasms, but not having that clitoral sneeze orgasm, A, (laughs) (laughs) it's really intense and really fast. Um, can help me to roll over into the energetic. Mm, Interesting. And do you feel that maybe the way that we started to masturbate is the circuitry that we're just so used to orgasming from? Yeah. It's like training. You know, if you're training for a marathon and you train in a certain way, when you go to run the marathon, you run in that certain way. Mm -hmm. And so with anybody's self-pleasure practice, it's how are you self-pleasuring and then how is that informing how you're having sex when you're with a partner or you're having sex on your own? Um, and I, when I say on my own, it's because I'm training in one session. I call it sex labs. I'm doing like a lab with myself versus mm-hmm. I'm just free forming. Mm-hmm. And so in that thinking about how you self-pleasure it's maybe I'm going to take an hour today and I'm going to do it in my blueprint versus the sexual blueprint. Cause I think a lot of people self-pleasure in the sexual blueprint when it's actually not where they're going to be most fulfilled. Um, and, and what do you want to explore? That's another question. I kind of make a hypothesis. This is how geeky I am. I make a hypothesis of, well, if I do this for this amount of time, then maybe I'll have this result. Mm. And because sexuality is an exploration, just like anything else. It's like playing, playing an instrument, playing the piano. It's well, here's my practice. I'm practicing my scales now, or I'm curious about something. Let's see what happens if I put this chord with this chord and that chord with that chord. And I start to make a song. 
oh, now I've got the beginnings of a song. Okay, now I'm just going to sit down and play a song. Mm. And so we have just like any anything else we're learning with sexuality, the journey is the same. Okay, I'm going to learn some techniques. I'm going to play some chops. I'm going to do some practicing. Okay, now I'm going to start to put things together to see what happens. Okay, and now I'm just going to play my instrument. Mm. And there's so much abundance in that of like giving yourself the space to play. Whereas when we're in the sex scarcity, it's almost like, (laughs) well, I don't know when this is going to happen again. So I'm just going to do my thing that I know will make me come fast. But when you know, this is just a a regular daily, weekly practice for myself, whatever it is, then you're not so tied to the result. You can allow yourself to just maybe try, you know, the anal beads. It wasn't your thing. You, You got to try it and see, or maybe it needed to have another note attached to it or another setting attached to it. So I love just giving yourself that space to play and explore. One of the things that I also do is I ask myself, what realm am I in as I'm playing? Mm. And, and I think your, your listeners will understand this. So there's the physical realm, there's the physical body. Am I playing in the realm of the physical body and how the physical body feels and how this touch feels on my body? Am I playing in the more emotional realm? Because we can do that with sex. It's the G spot is a great emotional space where you can go into just like holding your G spot or holding your vulva and really making contact with this and seeing what emotions rise up and then letting those emotions flow can be orgasmic. I think we get a little emotionally constipated, which affects the orgasmic flow Mm -hmm. of everything. And so it's like, okay, I'm angry. Can I make that like horny rage? Can I make that anger erotic? You know, can I play with that and be in the emotional realm with it? There's the transpersonal realm. And this is where we get into things like playing with past lives, you know, connecting in to like, who have, I think, I believe that all of it's happening now. Like it's, so it's not necessarily past. It's like everything's available to us right now. So all archetypes are available to us. And if you really resonate, like I really resonate with like the witchy, you know, tantrika, like those kinds of archetypes. And I can get in touch with that. Or I could call on, you know, an Egyptian goddess in my sensuality. And and so we have a whole thing of like, who's your erotic persona? And what do you want to develop? Maybe it's something that you disowned in your eroticism that you want to reclaim and you're playing in this more transpersonal realm or you're going into these altered states of consciousness and visiting other dimensions. Like there's so much that's possible. And then the last one is the truth realm. And oftentimes in the truth realm, I'll just go into the the state of who I am. And in who I am, I can't even define what sex is in that space. I don't, I'm still trying to figure that one out. That's been like an exploration for the last couple of years is how do I put words to something that is completely Mm. ineffable in that, in that state of perhaps I become one with everything and and I'm just pure love, Mm. you know? Mm. So they were the emotional, the transpersonal and the truth realm. Physical and and truth. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So powerful. I love that witnessing of what experience we're in and allowing ourselves to go to these heightened places of consciousness and even explore what's available for us there in that pathway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So great. So let's talk kinky. Kinky. So I feel like the kinky, like she was in the shadows and she's coming full force. Like Rihanna brought her out and we're, people are reclaiming her. So how, how do they eat their cake? Yeah. Um, it depends on what kind of kinky you are. (laughs) Yes. So, um, you know, if you're submissive, if you're dominant, if you're more of a sensation based kinky, if you want, maybe you want to sit on the cake. Um, you know, if you are more of a, um, cake, sit on my face. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, you know, maybe you want to be teased for three hours and, you know, you're not, your hands are tied behind your back and someone has the cake and they have to feed you every delicious morsel, or you have to beg for it, or you're the one feeding the cake, you know, Mm -hmm. to the person you, you eat it and they have to watch you eat it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So there's so many fun things we can play with because the kinky has, has many different flavors and endless creativity to it. You could be blindfolded eating your cake, tied up eating your cake. Um, 
you can only smell the cake and that's the rule. You can't even look at it. The only sense you get is smell and you've got a blindfold on and you know, you can't taste it either. Mm. So, or you can only hear someone eating it in your ear, you know? Mm. <laughs> so two different, but like there's an types. element of like a restriction, something you're not allowed uh-huh. to have. Yeah. There's the, the dynamic of power. One person mm-hmm. who's in power and one person who's surrendering to that power mm-hmm. agreed upon, you know, with consent And so two different types, there's the psychological, this is someone where it would be all about the psychology of the play, right? Maybe there's a cake sitting on the bed with a note and it says, do not eat, sit in the corner and wait for me. Mm -hmm. And then you sit in the corner and you wait and maybe you wait an hour and you're like, what's happening with this cake? And why am I sitting? You know, it's all this cognitive dissonance that gets to be created. That's more of the psychological play of it. Maybe nothing ever happens with that cake, but it was the game. Mm-hmm. It was the game. Like, that would just make me really angry. <laughs> 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 but it's so interesting because for someone else, that could be like the biggest turn on of not knowing what's going to happen. Yes, exactly. I know people who will orgasm just because when the person walks in the room. You know, they've mm-hmm. waited an hour, or they've been sitting there waiting, and then the person walks in the room and there's instant orgasm that'll happen mm-hmm. in the body just from the anticipation mm-hmm. of what might happen. Mm-hmm. And so there then there's also the sensation-based kinky. And the sensation-based kinky is someone who's turned on by the sensations of the ropes, by impact. Um, you know, maybe a little cake is rubbed on the bottom and there's a spanking over the cake. <laughs> So there's lots of different ways that you can play with that. And my yeah. partner is both, he's both psychological and sensation based. Mm. And so he has whole elaborate scenarios and he wants it exactly that way. Like he's such a like servant who's the master actually, you know, like I'm actually just really serving him, but he wants to be in the submissive role, but they're elaborate in, in, Every, every detail is thought out, but that's also his sensual coming into play because he's highly sensual and kinky. And so how that's all shaped, and he loves these like three hours, luxurious, all of the attention focused on him in a kink scene where mm. and then I'm in the more dominant role of that, of like taking a rope and spreading it over his skin for like a really, 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 really long time. Mm-hmm. Whereas my sexual is just like, oh my God, already, can we just like put some handcuffs on and be done with this? <laughs> yes. So it's an interesting expanding into someone else's territory when it's not your natural turn on. Yeah. And that's a beautiful reminder for us to, to really also give to our partners to like, I once had this realization, like the feminine is always giving and like, we, we never get to receive and like just all of the ancestral. And I feel like on a subconscious as women, we're like almost like angry when we have to give, when we have to like give the man that pure undivided love and attention. But it's so beautiful to honor our partner in that way and give them that experience that really means so much to them. And it, and it turns us on too, to see someone in their turn on like that. Absolutely. And then eventually it did become my turn on, you know, mm-hmm. eventually I wired into the kinky blueprint, but it took me a while. And that's when, you know, you've expanded into new blueprint territory is when mm. their turn on becomes your turn on. And it's just mm. that willingness to play and find like, well, where is my turn on? Where is my turn on in the stance? The shadow mm-hmm. side of the kinky is that they can feel a lot of shame. So they don't communicate what they actually want in the dance. You know, it's mm-hmm. like they don't share the dance steps with mm-hmm. you because they have so much shame about having out of the box. You know, I didn't even like out of the box. It's just whatever you think is taboo, mm-hmm. whatever you think is that edge. Yeah. That then becomes the thing that oftentimes in the shadow is like, I, I shouldn't be doing that. I'm, you know, I, that's too shameful for me. Yeah. Like I feel like butt stuff for the collective, like a lot uh-huh. of put that in, in <laughs> kinky, but it's really just a perspective thing. Right. Right. For a sexual butt stuff might not be taboo, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I just like anal sex. Mm-hmm. But somebody who is kinky, it is taboo. That's mm-hmm. the difference. So any mm-hmm. act can fit in any blueprint. But if it feels like, like I had a couple who had been married 40 years and they'd never had sex out of missionary position mm-hmm. because religion taught them that missionary was the only position that they could have sex in. 
And so when they started, they were like, they were like both kinky because everything was so taboo for them. It was like, oh my God, we're going to do what? (laughs) You know, it was, so they had a lot of high kinky because it was all so edgy. So fascinating. So it's not just what we think as a society of like whips and chains, handcuffs, like that is kink, but it's actually just whatever may evoke some feelings of, of a taboo. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. So fascinating. And now shapeshifter. Yes. How do they have their cake? So, so shake it up. <laughs> shapeshifter has a smorgasbord of cakes. Yes. Um, they have a whole they have a cake for every outfit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cake for every outfit. There are cupcakes, there are angel food cake, <laughs> all the different kinds. Yeah. And they like to sit down and have them in all the ways for as long as they possibly can. And they're not, not hardly ever full. Well, you've tried all the different cakes. Are you, are you satisfied yet? No, I haven't had that corner of that cake over there. Or, you know, I haven't had that one while I was standing on my head with my feet tied. <laughs> so I'm getting a little extreme, but, but they do have a huge capacity. It's like huge capacity for all the things all at once for long amounts of time. I actually you know, early on was so like enamored with shapeshifters because I couldn't understand how can you lay there for three hours <laughs> receiving from five people? Yeah. My mind is oh. being blown. Cause I'm like, I'm on that short circuit <laughs> side. I can't imagine like in a way that's very tantric, like their ability to just go and keep exploring and be in the container. Yeah. It has that. And I, I don't mean hedonism in the wrong, in a bad sense, but like a hedonistic Bacchanalian, you know, if we look at other archetypes, it's that Dionysian energy mm-hmm. of celebrating all of, all of it, all of it. And my, my theory is, I have not been able to prove this yet, but this is what I see in my practice over and over is people start off in one blueprint. And by the time we've been working together for a year or a couple of years, they're shapeshifters. Mm-hmm. And I think that this is because fundamentally who we are is a shapeshifter. We are all of the flavors. We are all of the things. And it gets conditioned out of us that something isn't okay, or we have a trauma, or we have something we experience in life where we've cut off some piece of ourselves, or we've covered up, or we've hidden away, or we've locked it somewhere. And we're not in the full expression of who we are as erotic beings. And the full expression, if we think about all of it, would be the shapeshifter. Mm-hmm. Now, the shapeshifter can have a shadow, which is cutting off those pieces of themselves because they've been told they're too much. They've been told they're overwhelming. They've been told they take too long. They want too much. They're too demanding. They're too loud. They're too everything. They're too much of everything. Mm-hmm. And they've tamped down throughout life. And so they shapeshift to please everybody else. So they still have that capacity to shapeshift to please other people, but they're not really getting fed. They're the most starving out of all the blueprints because they have all of them. They need all of that variety and and different flavors. Mm. The superpower is that they're amazing lovers because they can shift. They can shift constantly. And then there are, there's a shape, there's almost like a six type, but this is somebody who's a shapeshifter that doesn't have any of the positives of the blueprints. It's only the shadow side. Mm. Some people get stuck in all the shadows of the blueprints. It's like a shadow shapeshifter. Mm. And that's someone, you know, once you know your blueprints are four things to do once you know them. And the first, one of the first steps can be healing the shadow sides of the blueprints. So if you find yourself in the, you resonate with the shadows of all the blueprints then there's healing. It's like, take one that you resonate with a lot and just start to go on the healing journey. Mm. Yeah. I always, for some reason, thought the shape shifter was almost like a people pleaser of whatever you want. I will adapt to that, but it sounds like it's, it's not that it's more so they just enjoy the diversity of everything. And even there's some shame around wanting more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're caught in their shadow, they will adapt. Mm -hmm. They'll, they'll, people please, they will adapt to the other person because they haven't, well, they haven't realized themselves. They haven't realized that they are this shapeshifter. And so they don't, they're, they don't even know necessarily that they, that they're doing it. Mm. So the shapeshifters are really just 
Do you think if you're in between two or three, that makes you a shapeshifter or it's kind of its own thing? It's its own thing. It really is all of them. And, okay. and so we all have blueprint stacks. I call it stacking. And that's, you have a primary blueprint usually, and then there's a secondary and then a third one and then a fourth one. But if you're, if you take the quiz and you, you do the in-depth quiz and you get your different percentages, it'll, it'll tell you like, oh, you're 20% energetic. Maybe then you're 30% sexual or you're 40% sensual, like whatever percentages it is, it'll break down each blueprint. Now, when Mm -hmm. I took the quiz, this was a while ago, I need to take it again, actually. When I took the quiz last, um, I was 33% sexual and like 27% energetic. I think it was like 15%, uh, was it sec, was it, no, what was it? Shapeshifter, 15% shapeshifter. And then 5% sensual and zero kinky. Mm. Ian was highest in kinky Mm -hmm. (laughs) and 0% sexual. So you can see like where we were completely mismatched in our blueprint mapping. So it's really fascinating to me that we have all these mixes of percentages, but really you're a true shapeshifter. If you're seeing like across the board, almost all the percentages are really close. Like if they're all like 20%. Mm, So interesting. Do you find that we tend to attract people like like secure attachment styles. Like we tend to attract anxious, attracts avoided. Do we attract uh-huh. the opposite blueprint? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, and another one to kind of map on, right. Are you an anxious energetic? Mm. Are you like, like, is this really fun to see? Cause that affects, right. Or are you an avoidant? And like, I'm a super avoidant. I used to be, I'm more secure now, but I used to be a super avoidant. And mm-hmm. So it's just like, okay, we have our sex and I'm energetic. I want my space. Go away. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And, and so it's all really fascinating in that a lot of energetics will get with sexuals and the sexuals just want to come towards, come towards, come towards, have intercourse. And the energetics like, what? Total overwhelm. A lot of sensuals with sexuals. So you'll see this just, it's just very interesting. It's almost like all the other blueprints partner with a sexual. Hmm. And, and so that's fascinating to me how to watch. That's one thing we haven't done a lot of polling on, and it would be interesting to see how couples came out if almost everybody had a, a mismatch like that. Yeah. I would say for me, I'm sensual and energetic. And then my husband is sensual and sexual. So what's interesting about both being sensual is like, I want a full body massage, but he wants a full body <laughs> massage. It's like, no, give it to me. <laughs> so it's like both of us knowing, okay, maybe it's like both touching each other at the same time or, or taking turns. And I think it's beautiful that you're sharing that sometimes it is, you know, being there for your partner and it's not a compromise, but it really is from your own pleasure to be able to feed them the type of cake that they want to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you can find your own pleasure in both giving and receiving, there's more freedom. Mm. There's a lot more freedom. Mm. And it's okay to be like, you know what? I need three months of receiving. My tank is empty. And it's okay to be, it's okay to get like other people to help too. Like in terms of things that maybe aren't like intercourse, but it's like, I can go get a massage at the spa and have a very sensual, beautiful you know, some spas do like baths with rose petals and milk. And it's like, what can I do that's sensual that I can get fed within the agreements of my relationship mm. and play with, play with that. Maybe it's being with my girlfriends. Like we have, we have blueprint coaches and we have a lot of them get together as friends and just do like tie each other up and do sensation play. It's not intercourse. It's not genital touch, but it's a, a way of playing with your friends like it doesn't it, remember when you're kids and you just play sensation stuff and food and you like, you just play. Mm-hmm. And so I think sometimes we get trapped in an eroticism. That's like, Oh, I'm not allowed to feel these things outside of my relationship. And again, like your agreements within your relationship, like, is it okay to get together with your friends and all of you feed each other chocolate cake in your blueprints <laughs> for the day? <laughs> They're like, can I come? Yeah. <laughs> watch <laughs> and I can tell you something about their blueprint if they're saying those kinds of things right. right so I think that there's ways that we can get creative in feeding ourselves mm. when our tanks are very empty that 
maybe isn't always about our partner feeding us. And maybe it is. Are they willing to do that? Um, I don't have like a right, wrong about it. It's just mm-hmm. get creative in what really serves you. Mm. Yeah. I found for myself, if I dance before, mm-hmm. I'm so much more in my body and my juiciness. And that's a me thing. Like I get to choose if I'm going to do my belly dance practice or twerk. And I will Ugh. naturally just come into the experience so much more activated because I'm already in my body instead of spending the first 20 minutes of like, oh no, my head is still over here and I'm still not really landing. Right. So it's like little things like that of maybe you have your ritual that you do at the end of the day and you let your candle and you have your essential oils going and that's already doing a lot of the dropping you in work. So then when you are with your partner or with yourself, that foreplay has already happened to some yep. degree. That's that toggle for the sensual. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So, I love that you're doing those things. Thank you for sharing yeah. all of this. And you were so amazing in the love sex group show. It was so mm-hmm. like m- momentous to see that on Netflix, like on mainstream TV to see. And especially how is that couple doing, by the way, that well, beautiful couple they had their baby. Um, um, amazing. Yeah. I hope I gave something away if uh, people haven't seen it. <laughs> oh, is there a new season? <laughs> no, no, no. Just if people haven't watched Sex, Love and Goop yet and they hear that. <laughs> Okay. Well, I they're celebrating they their love. Yeah. <laughs> but they're doing great. They're doing yeah, great. And I feel like the show, it's so much more about just the journey and the witnessing and watching them unfold and to see you and Ian in practice too. I think many a energetic orgasms rippled across America. Oh, no. People are actually <laughs> texting me saying, I'm, I just, I'm having orgasms right now in my living room watching you, you know, like, so this is really fun. And it feels so much like it opened some kind of portal, you know, for both the profession, you know, of people who work in sexuality. Cause I think a lot of people don't think, oh, I'm going to go see a sex coach mm-hmm. or I'm going to talk to somebody who, does these kinds of practices and and expand our sexuality. Um, So it opened that portal, but it also opened a portal for a conversation, you know, just like what we're having. There are more and more conversations now going into the mainstream in terms of what's possible erotically, in terms of erotic blueprints. And, you know, fundamentally, I think it's increasing the love and connection that we have with each other. You know, when we can communicate who we are, that increases our connection. Absolutely. It helps people just understand us and we're able to connect on a deeper level. So thank you for creating this incredible body of work. It really is something that I believe has shifted humanity, you know, and thank you for being the channel for this vision moving forward. And where can listeners take this quiz and your courses and learn more from you? eroticbreakthrough.com is the website. I'm sure you'll put it somewhere linky yes. in the notes. Um, and then jaya.love, J-A-I-Y-A.love is my site if you want to go and find out more about what I'm up to in the world. Beautiful. Thank you again so much for being here today. Oh, it's been my great pleasure every moment. Mm, mm, mm. How delicious was that conversation? I could have chatted with her for hours. It is so fascinating to dive into the different archetypes around our sexuality, because this is something that we don't really get to see in other people. Someone's personality is very apparent to us, but we don't really know what they're like in the bedroom sheets. And this also is another way that our personalities manifest. In fact, it's our most deepest and intimate selves that very few people get to see. And even with our partners, sometimes we don't really truly get to show who we are. So I highly recommend doing the quiz and learning about your erotic blueprint so you can have more pleasure-filled, heart-centered, enjoyable sex that not only speaks your erotic blueprint, but your partner's and finding your own that you can share together. So I hope you love this episode. And if you're interested in diving in deeper with me in Rose Gold Goddesses, head over to rosegoldgoddesses.com. That link is in the show notes. And I can't wait to have you inside. Thank you so much for tuning in. Namaste. Namaste.